Center to Study the Middle East. Uh, thank you much for coming today. Um, before we start, we have uh, some of our uh, Sirani Kurdish pamphlets here, if you're interested. Uh, they're flying around here somewhere. Um, in addition, uh, if we could have you sign in on our sign-in sheet, um, the Center for the Study of the Middle East is a national resource center funded by the Department of Education. And because we receive our money from the government, they expect us to participate in their bureaucracy, which requires that we uh, collect your name. If you're on our uh, list already, um, our mailing list already, you don't, don't worry about it. Uh, if you'd like to join, you can put your email address down. Um, so without further ado, let me introduce to you our Kurdish instructor, um, Mr. Ben Priest. And thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you all for coming. Um, this is really nice to have an audience. Um, you know, as for having small audiences, that's pretty par for the course for Curtis Day. So it's really okay. I'm quite comfortable with this. Okay, so um, Kurds, Kurdish, and Kurdistan. Um, I'm going to start off with, you know, the coolest way to avoid copyright infringements is take your own pictures. You know, that is it's one, one bonus for traveling abroad. All right, so I'm going to talk a bit about, you know, a little bit about the culture, uh, a good bit about the language, because this is, in fact, uh, more or less a, sp uh, a pitch to say, hey, please join Kurdish if you can, and if this interests you. And then talking, uh, um, I'm not going to talk much about my own research, but I'm doing my PhD in Islamic studies. Uh, it's on Kurdish nationalism and Islam. Hoping to get finished with the first draft by the end of this semester, defend in August. Okay, so... Uh, everybody, uh, just to get this out of the way, I tend to be not personal about these things, and people keep asking me how I got into this because I'm very obviously a very American, not from that area. Um, when I was a little kid, I loved Indiana Jones. Um, and you can talk about how Orientalist or not in sync with current it is, but in my head, all I hear is the theme song going. So, all right, so that was me as a kid. I got going with that. My dad got an economist subscription. I got hooked to that. <laughs> Um, I started Arabic at uh, Brigham Young University. I studied um, Egyptian in Cairo for several months. Uh, went with my wife, traveled a bit in the area. I got involved with Iraqi refugees in Salt Lake City, Utah, and was part of a project that I kept running into Kurdish sources. It looked like Arabic, but it wasn't at all. <laughs> I felt like I had recognized maybe one in every 10 words, but the rest of it was quite beyond me, and I became both frustrated and curious. So when I started applying for programs, I applied to Indiana University because they had Sarani Kurdish. And I could not find anywhere else uh, in the country uh, that had that. And so I applied, I got in, I got a job teaching Arabic. Story behind that, but it's a funny picture. Um, uh, but let's see, so I got a job teaching Arabic and I had to wait a couple years before we started the program. In 2015, I was part of the first class that did Sarani Kurdish at IU um, for a while. And then my, uh, through kind of a labored series of events, I ended up in Istanbul uh, doing some pre-dissertation research because Istanbul was my safe choice. Um, I was there for several terrorist attacks and uh, coup attempts, so mm -hmm. I learned that there really isn't such a thing as a safe choice. It's just you choose. <laughs> so I chose to go to Iraq. And I spent uh, a deal of my time uh, from about September to the end of Dece beginning of September to end of December 2017 in Iraq. Um, I was there for the referendum and then for all the aftermath. So as an ethnographer, it was absolutely golden time. As uh, a foreigner, it was difficult. Um, so anyway, and now I'm here. I'm now in 3027, and I get to teach Kurdish. It's a small class, but we're working on getting this into a self-sustaining program uh, with enough students. And I really think that if we get it out there, there's, uh, there's enough crossover between a lot of languages that are being taught and a lot of the interests that are at IU. All right, so let's talk a little bit about Kurds in general. There are about 40 to 50 million Kurdish speakers. Censuses in the Middle East are problematic, to say the least. So that number is a spitball, and it really depends on who you ask. Um, this is generally the spread of where Kurdish speakers live. Um, now because, and I, it's very human and it's very natural for when you watch the news, people talk about Kurds, like this big block, you know, talking about Americans. Americans are doing this, like, well, how many? Yeah, 360 Americans, lots of different things. Same thing with Kurds, you know. Let's talk a little more about what this actually is. Um, even then, this is still a simplification. Um, this is 
another version of spread. So there are multiple dialects of Arabic, or not, excuse me, that's true too, but multiple dialects of Kurdish. Um, Sorani is spoken down in this area, so north, uh, northern Iraq, uh, western Iran, and if I were to make this map myself, I would make it a spectrum, because everything bleeds into each other. And because during the 1990s, they started having a lot more uh, Kurdish satellite stations broadcasting from Western Europe. So there started to be some standardization of the dialect. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the history of the languages within the, the um, countries themselves. But for all intents and purposes, the first time there was a real um, push to have any kind of standardization because you know, you're receiving, you, you only have so many stations to hear a Kurdish perspective in Kurdish, but if you speak Haudamani and they're speaking a version of Kurdamanji, you know, it makes it more difficult to learn. So things are coalescing. Um, I'll listen to the radio now and I can hear people, it's all kind of uh, blending together. Uh, well, that, so that's true, but at the same time, I could leave the city within 15 minutes, I'd find someone I did not understand at all. Um, I've actually got one. It's not a slide. This actually I got from a gentleman, uh, Shavkat Hassan, who contacted us. He made a, uh, he made a, whatchamacallit, a dictionary for Kurdish on his own and wanted to give it to us. So I'm actually still going through it. But he sent this with it. This is a uh, breakdown. This is both fascinating and frightening um, of the dialects. Um, so this is... Uh, and it's the Kurdi Bashuri, that's northern or uh, southern Kurdish, Kurdi Nawant, uh, middle Kurdish. Kurdish. Um, technically, what I speak most of is this and this. <laughs> but the truth is, is that they blend a lot. So there are going to be a lot of things that are very similar, um, and a lot of things you can find out just by context. And the, the deeper you go into Kurdish, the more the rest of this becomes accept accessible. Um, so it's both very frightening, but also like just as a student and as a teacher. But at the same time, it's uh, it's very interesting, and it uh, in terms of getting around and understanding every uh, the area, it shows the importance of uh, of learning these things. Because if you have any interest in those places, knowing how to even just do a little bit of this goes a long way, a long way. Even if you have the standard and can do a little bit in some of these other ones, which is what I do it goes a, a great deal. Um, let me jump back to my main slide. Again, I got that one this morning, so I was a little excited about it in the nerdiest way possible. Uh, let's see. Okay, so we've got some, I, I knew we'd have some Turkish speakers, probably some Arabic speakers too, yes, Persian, actually we got everybody I want. So, uh, in terms of <coughs> words, so one thing that I, really am, a, am a, an emphatic uh, advocate of is cross-pollination at IU. I, I think the more we do it, the better off we all are. Um, I am in a position that I was able to take pretty much every of the main, except for Hebrew, I took most of the main languages uh, for the Middle East and Central Asia in, uh, the, I got to take Turkish. Um, I got to take uh, Persian. And uh, it's very close to Kurdish. It, I've mean, heard a lot of people call Kurdish drunk Persian. So and if, if that Kurdish is drunk Persian, Zazaki is like Persian on acid. Uh, they're nice folks, but it's, <laughs> it's out there. Um, so anyway, I actually uh, went through, kind of made it a little etymological thing. So because of the Islamic empires, there are an immense amount of Arabic words borrowed throughout these languages. Uh, including Turkish, even though these are, uh, well, including English, there are four different family groups that you're talking about. So, um, but yeah, so it's, uh, the more you learn about these other languages, the more these other languages become more accessible to you. Because I'll be talking with someone in Kurmanji, and I asked, I was in a, I was in a taxi driver, and I said, you know, here's the word in Sarani, what is it in, in, in Kurmanji? He says, oh, it's this. I'm like, that's Turkish, dude. Like, there's nothing whatsoever Kurdish about that. <laughs> but, you know, if, the more you learn these things, the more accessible this entire region becomes. So one thing I really want to stress is that for students that are taking, that are ROTC or in humanitarian studies or journalism, they're taking a large language. Um, sometimes these little languages or other large languages are so complementary, and it really opens up a lot of opportunities. It takes time, but it takes time to build, uh, you know, 
value-added skills, which is very much what I believe these languages to be. Okay, so we show them the area where Kurdish has been only spoken. Uh, the history of Kurds, that's a long one. There's a history of everybody. That's, everybody's history is a long one when it comes down to it. But the long and the short of it is that after World War I, uh, there was talk in the Treaty of uh, Lausanne to give them their own state, much like Armenia. That did not turn out to be the case. Um, the Kur and so in terms of creating a Turkey, and I can't give this topic anywhere near enough justice, but essentially they were trying to, to form a Turkish identity. And the Ottomans have been struggling with this for more than 100 years before this happened. But uh, they made a big push for revitalizing the Turkish language and creating what the ideal Turk was. Uh, unfortunately for Kurds, uh, this was very problematic for them. The, the language is very oppressed, it still very much is. And I don't mean that, like, I, when I say that, I'm talking about history and it's complicated and I don't want to, I'm not saying anything bad about Turks. I just hope that's incredibly clear. <laughs> I love Turks, they're so lovely people. Um, just a, it's a complicated history is what I'm trying to say. Um, but uh, it, there has been a lot of violence associated with that. Uh, so these are some more of the folks that were involved. Um, like I said, I'm a Star Wars fan. Um, Okay, so you've got four main countries where Kurds are living in, uh, and they all have their own histories. And again, this is where learning those other languages as part of learning Kurdish, or you know, learning that and then learning Kurdish really helps because learning these other histories, I like, I would uh, this entire area would have been entirely inaccessible to me, and a lot of perspectives unaccessible. We had to not learn Turkish and go on to actually Turkey. Like I learned so much that way, and the same thing with Iraq. Uh, some of the places in Iran, all I could get were bits and pieces through people whose cousins lived on the other side of the border. That was really all I could get to. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about that in just a moment. Um, let's see. Okay, anyway, there's Curse Fan. So let's talk about, in terms of future importance, um, everybody likes to, most people like to gripe about the military industrial complex and oil relations and things like that, but uh, it's easier to do that when you didn't live through 1973 oil. Uh, oil issues, <laughs> where life comes to a grinding halt. Uh, well, I would agree that uh, that fossil fuels and things are a national security item. They're, it's, they're not going anywhere for a long time. This area is a massive, uh, massive store of fossil fuels, and a lot of that falls in Kurdistan. And then talking about uh, food security, water security, which is a very big issue now and will continue to be in the future. Uh, these water tables also spread all throughout Kurdistan. Uh, there are some 20 or 30 dams that have been built up in this area, up in um, eastern Turkey, uh, which uh, basically make electricity. Uh, it's providing some more services to Turkey's Kurds in kind of a, uh, a goodwill gesture. Um, but as we, as things are right now, we'll see how that happens, how things continue to progress in that area. But in terms of uh, people that are interested in international studies, international relations, these areas have a very strong strategic importance in terms of resources. And I, I, it kind of, I, not kind of, I massively cringe. Every time people say, our, a president of ours says, you know, we've, we were victory, we're done here. It's like, okay, we'll be back in four years. And I'm sorry to say it. Um, so they tend, and, and unfortunately the tendency of, especially government agencies, is they like to hire when the problem's happening. But the cool thing about, if I had a more gra undergraduates here, I'd say the same thing. We've got a couple. Who, how many grads? How many got? Won't you know. So we've got, uh, one of the cool things is, is that you can gain these skills, and then you know, when the calls come up, if that's an industry you're interested in, you know, you've got the skills that they need. Um, but in terms, of, in, in terms of humanitarian stuff, let's talk about, OK, so basically just showing you, it's important. It's going to stay important. Okay, our humanitarian steps. Uh, talking about the Iranians, so I had, I have very little access to information, uh, direct information from Iranian Kurds. Like my, my dissertation left almost nothing on them because it's all second, third, fourth hand. Um, when I was in, uh, when I was in um, Iraqi Kurdistan, there was an earthquake that we felt. I was in the 19th story. I was on Skyping my mom with my roommate. We looked at each other, what's going on? <laughs> and uh, so we felt it all the way in Erbil. 
but in, it was massively felt in eastern Iran, which was uh, especially like Kurmanshan or Kurmanshah, which are um, in some of these other areas around there. Uh, the official Iranian response was that a few hundred died, but when you actually talk to Kurds who like, my cousin lives there, like no, way more died, significantly more. Um, I mean, in terms of just how intertwined everything is in terms of international relations, uh, these areas are just uh, are going to continue to be having issues of this uh, variety. And for those involved in humanitarian <coughs> things, that's, those skills have a place. Um, as we know, there's still the ongoing crisis. Uh, Europe is filled with Kurds that have been fleeing these horrible situations. I, oh man, I was listening to an Australian Kurdish podcast yesterday and they apparently, there's just a cold sickness to this. There's some of the, the Dash wives, the women that joined ISIS to become wives, they apparently became good enough at mimicking Yazidi women that they could pass as one, which is really sick when you think about what those women were as compared to the Dash women. Like, I just, uh, but they actually try to get, uh, they try, I've heard a lot of times they try to bring Kermanji speakers in to talk to these Yazidis. They won't get it because they speak Badini. It's a lot closer to Sirani. So it's just, I, I, I've seen it happen. Like, oh, you're not going to get a thing out of this. <laughs> but it's not funny. But I, I laugh because it makes things easier to deal with. Um, this is actually one of my favorite pictures I took. It's really mundane looking. But those are all taxi drivers. And they're all playing a game using broken pieces of concrete. And those are all their taxis. Just this line delved into these things, the more I really appreciate these different peoples and their different stories. Uh, Kurds are the exact same way. You know, I've heard people say, well, basically Persians. Like, eh, no, they say no. Uh, and even then, Persians, there are lots of different kinds of Persians. But uh, especially in the last couple decades, they've finally been able to make their own library. I took this picture, again, an innocuous picture, but it was my roommate's father. Who was, a, uh, who was a teacher uh, in Eastern, Kur Eastern Iraqi Kurdistan uh, for decades. And he had three of his homes demolished entirely, meaning all the, the books that were in Kurdish uh, that he had buried in the walls and on the floors were demolished as well. Because they were all illegal. You, know, you, couldn't, you couldn't disseminate these materials in, your, in the Sarani language. Uh, so the fact that he had this big bookcase at the top of his stairs, um, it was really significant because it just showed that this they finally had this, this victory of their own that they could, they could speak in their own culture. And it wasn't, they don't like Arabic. I mean, it, there are lots of Arabic textbooks up here as well, and he used both as well as some Persian. Um, but being able to, yeah, being able to, to speak in your own mother tongue and to be understood in your own mother tongue, that's such a massive thing. I woke up one night, like 4 a.m., with the thought that learning a language is learning to love someone. And it's kind of a sentimental, uh, idea, but it's grown on me, that the more you gain to know these things, the more you have an appreciation for who a person and a people are. Um, this is actually a picture of, uh, this was like two months after the vote happened. That little bit right there is the tiny bit of blue, uh, blue ink from the mayor of Kirkuk, his vote on the referendum. They wore that like a badge of pride. Um, so the fact that it, for as many issues as their democracy has, and most, most I mean, every democracy does. But uh, as many as they have, they're very proud of the fact that they have one. Um, let's see. Uh, Kurds are secular. One of my main purposes is going to Kurdistan. How am I doing on time? Let's see. I talk too much. I'll talk more quickly, <coughs> or less, rather. Uh, one of my main issues was that I didn't feel like this was a great portrayal of what was actually going on. It just didn't jive with what I had learned that, uh, thus far. And when I went to Iraqi Kurdistan, it really was. It's the, I mean, again, talking about news stories, when you're talking about things from all over the world, you've got to condense it into bite-sized pieces that more or less get the gist of what's going on. And we only have so much time and so much emotional capital to spend on any given issue. Um, but when you're getting to the nitty gritty of it, it's an extremely, uh, extremely textured reality in terms of uh, the relations between Islam and, uh, and Kurdish culture. Um, to the extent that like, okay, Slimani or Suleimaniya, there are, there's a big um, resurgence of Zoroastrianism because saying that it is, their, it is the Kurdish religion you now that they were forced to convert. Um, there are a lot of people that are just uh, really burned out in religion in general because of ISIS and because of Heshti Shabi. 
um, you know, the um, popular, the Hesht al Shaab, um, popular units, the, and a lot of the ethnic strife that are going on in the country. Can't say I blame them too much. Um, but there are quite a few that were uh, extremely uh, dindar, were very, uh, very religious. And, uh, you know, you, you push them on some of these things at times and you will get a reaction. Uh, the only time I felt physically threatened when I was, uh, I mean, I, go to a I went to a mosque every Friday. I went to one that was right next to my house uh, in Main Airville. And this is like the city. This is one of the more secular places in the area. Um, I went and it was the time after the Jerusalem embassy debacle where uh, uh, President Trump announced that the American embassy was moving from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. And I went in there, you know, I, I'm, I'm not a Muslim, uh, but I, uh, you know, everyone's always been very gracious to have me there. I, I stand and I, you know, I try to, you know, I make sure everyone's got room to do their prayers and I'm not in the way. Um, by that time, I drew a great deal of attention by not praying and I had a very large group follow me out and was rather aggressive about, you know, who are you? Who are you? And it, this is encouraged, but you know, I try to introduce myself, and I'm like, okay, you guys are just mad. So I led them on a nice tour of the area for about 30 minutes, and finally they decided to quit. Um, but I mean, guess what? I'm going with that one is that uh, you know, if you go by this idea, of, oh, all Kurds are secular. No, so complicated. Uh, another part of my my own research was, which I think is some of the bedrock of my personal research, is and it, like investigation, but I basically did my own quasi-investigation of the murder of two, uh, a series of murders of imams in Iraqi Kurdistan, where I went to the parties that they belonged to, and I talked to their officials, and then I went and talked to the official, uh, what is that uh, in English? Uh, they're basically, their they're, they're version of the Dianet, their uh, Al-Qaf organization, their, their religious uh, ministry. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know why I have a hard time. I never use it in English. They don't spit it out. Um, yes, their religious ministry. So I go back and forth between these places, going to Halle. Then I go to Rania, where things are significantly different. Uh, where like the the Kurdish uh, Democratic Party's headquarters had got firebombed like six months before. You know, there's just tensions. Uh, but I learned a lot in those. For as much as they didn't tell me, they told me a lot. <laughs> and again, if I didn't have Kurdish, I, I would have been wasting my time because it just wouldn't have happened. Um, so, talking about why taking surrounding Kurdish, uh, we've got some contemporary issues that are and will continue to be um, feeling repercussions of that in the future. Um, if you're interested in involvement in humanitarian issues, Kurdish is a language that's, that's very, very happening, unfortunately. Um, in terms of culture, it's its own culture. I mean, in terms, if, you, if you like ethnography, if you like anthropology, you know, these are, there are some fantastic stories that are to be had. I mean, that's true of any language. I'm, I'm not saying Kurdish owns the <laughs> thing on that because I mean, we, we come from a, from a university that has so many languages. And I'm doing myself a disservice by saying, you know, just take something. Like, if you don't want Kurdish, take something, because we've just got so much to offer. And they all have their own things to offer. Um, anybody recognize what that is? It's a cancer cell. So my personal perspective is that you know, ISIS is really Al-Qaeda 6.0. You know, and that a lot, of the, a lot of the strategies treat a lot of these organizations as, uh, as like one and done viruses. What these really are is a an immunodeficiency born of the uh, instability in the region. And those exist, those uh, conditions still exist. So what these guys do is they go back under hiding. Like, it kills me. Like, I, I'll read the English papers, and they'll say, you know, ISIS is gone. And they'll go to the Kurdish papers, like, yeah. So six guys went to ISIS. They went, or from ISIS, they went to a mosque. They called out these guys. They shot one, took the rest, and then ransomed their families. So that's what they did. They just go underground. This is what they do. They can't. I, it's not boggling to me that they lost their state. They were never a governing organization. These guys are robbers and bandits. <laughs> I mean, this is what they do. So they just go underground. And because the, the, there's still instability, they'll be back. So this is still a problem, and it will continue to be. Um, and in terms of understanding the complexities of uh, things over there, and Kur just Kurdish relations by themselves are just massively complex, much less understanding them within the context of Iran or Iraq or Turkey or Syria. So the more you learn about these things, and if, if you have any interest in Kurdish, uh, Kurdish issues, Kurdish culture, take Kurdish. 
If you don't, you know, read an article or two. Uh, but take something. Take Turkish. Take Arabic. Take Persian. Take take Kazakh. Take. I, I love this university. I, I I'm so grateful to it. And uh, I guess I should have started off by saying I'm really grateful for the opportunity of taking the Sorbonne here. It really changed my life. And uh, same thing with Turkish or Persian Arabic. Like I just I'm a, I'm a better person for this. And again, this we're we're talking about you know getting jobs, <coughs> making making difference in our own realms of influence. But for me, that's what it's done for me. So uh, thank you very much. I hope I went some places I didn't plan on that. But um, the rest of the time is open for questions and pizza. So and I've also got some uh, show and tell because I'm that kind of person. Uh, just some dictionaries. I've got a Kumanji book of Kurdish folklore. I've got a book written by Ali Bapir, who is one of the Islamic party heads. Um, Yes, thank you very much, and I'm open for questions. You know, the pass these around or just take a look at uh, Ben B, first of all, thank you very much for uh, this great presentation. Thanks for being here. Uh, could you just share uh, with us the difficulties that you have experienced when you are when you were in uh, northern, you know, Iraqi Kurdistan? Okay. Um, in terms of like culture, language, you know, the attitudes. That's a good question. Uh, it was very difficult uh, navigating the bureaucracy. Um, it's not terribly politically correct to say it, but it felt like Cool Hand Luke. Uh, I don't know if you've ever seen that film. There's, it's essentially an old southern uh, prison gang outfit where the, the uh, guards were very harsh on the prisoners. And the prisoners, in turn, uh, created their own systems of oppression with, uh, for and making hierarchies within their own selves. It felt like that in Iraqi Kurdistan, where because it sucked for everybody, the people at top made it worse for the people below them. Uh, it's not a complimentary thing, and I know some friends that would get very angry at me saying that. But, I got, okay, so I spent most of the time trying to get, let me find this. No, I don't have it with me. It took me most of the time I was there to get a residency card. Um, it, it's very difficult to do. Um, but while I was there, I spent a lot of time there. I, was a fly on the wall for a lot of really difficult situations. I had a, there was a man in there that came in and he had just basically, we could pile him in his car and his family. And he's trying to convince this case officer. He's like, hey, you know, please, like, I'm a Kurd, let me stay. <laughs> and he, you know, he's speaking Kurdish. There's no, there's no if, ands, or buts. You know, he looks like a Kurd, he speaks like a Kurd, he's a Kurd. Um, but you know, he didn't have the right paperwork. He didn't have the right thing. So this, it's, a, it's called wasta, it's connections. Um, so being outside of that Wasta system, even though my American passport was kind of like a magical talisman that granted me access to a lot of things, uh, so in that, in that sense, I've got a lot less to complain about than most of the Kurds there <laughs> because uh, I was either, it was kind of this magical place for me. I was uh, too important to dispose of these <coughs> places where I went to some places that oh, Americans are not welcome, but if an American went missing, it would cause more problems than it would if you just left him alone. Um, and then the other place is that uh, it, people were interested in talking to America. So I got, I got a lot of access that way. Uh, it was difficult with the language because there really are these massive dialect differences. So for as much as, so I could really get around with what I spoke. Uh, but every time I got a new taxi driver, I could talk to them and they'd tell me like, oh, Hassani. I'm like, what is that? It's like, oh, it's Hauramani for Choni. I'm like, I'll write it down. So, uh, and I just have a lot of things I wrote down. Um, see, I, uh, I actually got to experience, I went to uh, the first mixed martial arts tournament in Iraqi Kurdistan was, uh, was, in, uh, was while I was there, just, uh, and I'm a big MMA fan. And I went to a gym and I got to spar with a bunch of people, so I got to really know a lot of folks. Um, and a random thing, they all like, especially the Arab guys, they really liked to, they liked to spar with me, and they'd say, we'll go 30%. And they kicked me as hard as they could. And I'm like, that's not 30%. You just broke me. <laughs> I'm out for a week because, you know, you went 30% on me. <laughs> and they weren't mean about it. This was just, I think that there was an unconscious sense of needing to show that they were strong, especially to this American. So, again, it just a lot of interesting little perspectives that show some larger cultural uh, issues. So I think that there's a lot of... Uh, a lot of people felt very indignant and they wanted to preserve their honor and their face. And they, 
did that as best they could in some times that was really uncomfortable for everybody else. <laughs> so, I, I don't, did that answer your question? Yeah, I kind of wandered. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, Please. Uh, I'm wondering, how do you see the relationship between uh, Kurdistan as government with Iranian or people or people? Did you see Iranians in Kurdistan? Yes. And how was the relation between the two governments? Okay. Uh, so uh, I actually had an interview with uh, with Rudal, the main uh, K, the main KDP news organization. The first week I was there, and he asked me. I, I had to ask have honestly twice because I thought he was kidding me. Uh, he's like, "Well, do you think the Iranian government will change their mind about this?" I'm like, well, "Why would they do that? <laughs> they have no interest in having an, uh, like an autonomous, like a fully autonomous Kurdish nation to their border. Um, it's an uncomfortable position." So. Pretty much, Kurdistan is as landlocked possi as possible, and they depend entirely on, like not entirely, but pretty darn much on smuggling. Like you go to the borders, that's all that happens. Like 99 out of 100 people at the border are just smuggling, back and forth, all day. That's what they do. Um, so they have a lot of business. They all, it's an interdependent relationship in terms of economics, because everything comes in from Turkey or comes in from Iran. And that's basically, I guess it comes from the south as well, but mostly that's how it goes. Uh, so there's only so much the KRG can offend the Iranian government. Um, they pushed as hard as they could during the referendum. I should, they, meaning most of the Barzanis, but it also reflected a, a genuine Kurdish desire for a nationhood. Um, but I think that they thought that the West would bend, that we said, no, 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 but when it actually happened, we'd say, okay, fine. We didn't. Um, but uh, in terms of... There were some racial attitudes, like again, going back to the gym I was at, I used to spar a lot with this Persian guy, real nice guy, but he'd always insist to speaking me in English. He did not want to even heard speaking Persian in the gym. Like I would do a little bit with him, but he would be very uncomfortable. And at first I thought it was because I was American, but then I realized it's because no one else around them really cared for Persians, or Iranians. Um, you know, it's too bad because he's just there, you know, he's just a dude, he's doing his job. Um, but uh, there was a distrust there, unfortunately. There were a lot of, uh, there's a lot of racial charged attitudes in terms of Shiites, Shiite Arabs, and in terms of, okay, Shiite Persians, <laughs> um, and Alevis, and uh, unfortunately, there's a, there's a lot of racism, uh, not with everybody, I don't want a blanket statement that one, but I did uh, come across that frequently, mm -hmm. is that they were like, oh, the Persian, don't trust them when you deal with, don't trust them, with them. they probably say the same. So, and it just, it's tricky. Um, in terms of people though, but a lot of times, <coughs> Um, especially because there are Kurds on both sides of the border, a lot of them are family. And that was, uh, it was an information network because it was difficult to go between. And, uh, yeah, I mean, and because, uh, even like, talking again about my, uh, my roommate's father, for a long time he had to do, uh, he had to supplement his income by uh, being a kolavar, like being a smuggler with a truck. So he spent time in Iran. You know, so you start making connections. Uh, so, there's both, there's both racism, but there was also both a very obvious in, uh, co-reliance. So it's, it's tricky. Did that answer your question? Sure. Yeah. Sure, okay. So, uh, does Sorani work as serve as lingua franca for other Kurdish dialects, or? For the most part. Uh, I, it wouldn't make any difference to you if I pulled it up. But like if you go to like the main newspaper in Erbil and the main newspaper in Slimani, let me see if I can find a map to at least give you some kind of. Okay, so. Uh, that's weak. All right, so you go to the newspaper here, you go to the newspaper here, you will find big differences between how they're written. Um, but the weird thing is, is that there are a lot of things about the way it's written here that remind me of how things are written up there. <laughs> So it's this, uh, but if I used the Sarani I had, I could get around. I could get around pretty much anywhere. That being said, I would find pockets of people where nothing. But I would also talk to my, my friends and be like, did you, what, what did they say? Like, it's very difficult to understand. <laughs> because, well, okay, so great example. Um, again, another friend, uh, he was actually an ex-PKK commander that was living in Slimani. He was born in Iran, he was born, uh, he was born in, uh, in Mahabad, uh, traveled to Turkey to fight with the PKK. He was basically, his job was blowing up tanks. That's what he did. That's what like, he did for a living. But he fell out with leadership. He's in, 
he, the only place he could live was right here. He had no papers, he had nothing. So that's a bad place to be in the Middle East. You know? So he basically went from being this uh, a commander to being, he was an errand boy. Um, you know, this 50 year old errand boy. But I got to sit down with him, talk to him a bit about it. First thing he told me was that PKK leadership, all hypocrites. And jives with me. Um, but talking to him was extremely difficult because he spoke like he was from here, here, and up there. So he had all these things jumbled up together. So I had to have my friends there from different places be like, help me understand this guy. <laughs> but for the most part, like I'd say 85% of the time, if I spoke Sarani, they would get it because it, uh, there is a melding that is happening like on an almost daily basis. I listen to the radio. And because they're having significantly more, uh, more commerce, I mean, commerce and internet and these kinds of communications, they really have an effect of, you can't just speak like your town right here if you're really gonna be you know, going up here because you work for a security camera company. You know? um, so I think that that's one reason why, I showed you that, that really big spreadsheet of all those different dialects, but really they're condensing. And uh, yeah, so. Uh, yeah. Two more Please, yeah, no, go for it. Uh, about the written script, I yes. noticed that from the glass table, I noticed that the Sorani are the but long vowels and short vowels, I think they're marked there. Uh, so but at the same time, I noticed that they're like complex, uh, constant, constant, constant clusters are allowed to. Yeah, let me. Uh, my, okay, so a, a, a word, the word for bow down, uh, it, but that's like four, vowel, four uh, consonants in a row. Um, unlike a lot of air, uh, languages in the area, like uh, you know, Turkish likes to have the, these uh, cons or these vowels to split things up. Uh, Arabic doesn't feel comfortable having more than two consonants in a row. Um, they don't mind, but they also everything is written. Like the, there are no uh, there are no short vowels that are si that are not unwritten. Like unlike Arabic and Persian, everything is out. There are no digraphs, so like everything that, for the most part, it's phonetically written, and you can read it just by looking at it. You don't have to have known the word. No, but is that an alif? I mean, is that a you know a fatha or kasra, like Arabic or Persian? Um, so yeah, but it's phonetic mostly. And on your second slide, there's like I know there's Pakistani on the east part of the province. And right side again is on the right. So oh yeah, that's. So why is it? What's the historical background? Yeah. That's a fine. No, oh. <coughs> what's the historical background of how those guys got over yeah. there and how they get over here? Uh, so that's a speck of one, right on the left side of the. Yes. And, and then yeah. and then it's up here too. Yeah. They're pretty far. <laughs> I'd have to ask them. Background. <laughs> it's just one of those weird migration things where uh, I don't actually know the particular history. And part of that is because there really aren't any reliable, like, really well done histories of, Kur of Iranian Kurds. Like, for as many people have emigrated since the 70s, uh, no one's really written a ton about it. And it's kind of a pity because, I don't know, I haven't been able to find anything on why they are up there. But you know, pretty far from home, that's a, I've never been to Iran, that's a big old di the distance between those. So I don't know. It's a good question. Um, I hope that someday we'll get that history, but I don't have it. I don't know it. Please. And what I heard about that and please. No, please. Know, you may know more than me on that. They asked the people in Iran, like Kurdish people were moved by the Iranian government to that area so they can spread. So they can spread that's them and then they spread all over the country mm -hmm. for assimilation purposes. Yeah, well, that's. Same thing they did in Turkey. Wouldn't really surprise me whatsoever. But I don't know when that happened, I guess. Like, I kind of, I guess I kind of assumed it was government directed. <laughs> because for that very reason, you know, you, you start, uh, it's, you might have less problems, and you just move them. But, like, I, I didn't read it anyway. I just heard it from a couple of other Iranian people. That's how it goes, I know, though. <laughs> I don't know how true information this is. It wouldn't surprise me. That's the thing, is that's, uh, it, it's absolutely, uh, falls in line with everything I've read in actual in Kurdish history, which is backed up by these true sources. But unfortunately, that is how a lot of stuff gets learned is by, I had a friend yeah. <laughs> who told me. I've got that, I'm an ethnographer because so much of what I've learned is my friend told me, my cousin told yeah. me, my uncle lived here, <laughs> you know, so.
it's not the best answer, but unfortunately it's how Kurdish goes. <laughs> if my students were here, I would, they would tell you the same. Please. Um, so I understand that after the referendum, the Iraq Kurdistan now views itself as an independent country and not some kind of an autonomous region within Iraq, right? It is an autonomous region, but nothing changed after the referendum. If nothing, they, the Iraqi government reasserted itself over the borders and over the airports and more or less reminded them that this was a federalized country with which they would not be leaving. So for example, in Soleimani or in Erbil, there is an airport, but that airport actually regarded by the Iraqi federal government. So the way that it worked out actually is that uh, uh, during the referendum, the Barzanis who live up here and everything, my, my roommates and I referred to, this was their term, not mine, but I incorporated it, they called them mafias. That was the easiest way to understand how these parties work because there are no political differences, there are family differences. Um, so the Barzanis up here stood very much to benefit from this referendum. It was very much led by them. Uh, I mean, it was absolutely cult of personality and to a T. Um, the Talibanis who live down here, um, they would stand to lose from this. So they spoke to the, I don't have a source that says this, but we all knew this is what happened, that uh, they spoke to the, uh, uh, spoke to the Heshta Shabi folks, the guys that were coming up, they spoke to them and said, hey, we will leave our positions uh, when you come up, but you go easy on us. So the Slimani airport stayed open, even though the Halair, Air, the Airbill airport up here was closed and remained closed for some time. Um, it was essentially to hurt business and to remind them that they don't actually have as much control as they think, as they would like. And they did the same thing with the border. The border got, uh, the, the actual Iraqi central government forces beefed up significantly there. So, so in fact, even though they're not fully, well, they claim themselves independent, but there are Iraqi forces on the outside border. Yes. So sort of like, I guess sort of like Gaza in Israel, because Ga Gaza, there may be no Israeli government, Israeli government troops in Gaza, but they still come from the border between Gaza and Egypt, for example. Yeah, like pretty much everything internally is done by the, uh, the Asaish, the security police, the, uh, the Kurdish security police, and even then, they depend on the, uh, it depends on which party it is. You can tell the difference in the uniforms uh, between the checkpoints. So, but yeah, it's internally policed by Kurds, but the borders, have especially after the referendum, had significantly more Iraqi uh, central government presence. If that answers your question. All right, so let's see, for example, when you fly to the other side, mm -hmm. from Munich or Zerbe, I don't know much of their flights from, from this country, you still go through the Iraqi customs there at the Suleimani airport. Yeah. Just have to have an Iraqi visa. You, actually, the Iraqi visa, here's the tricky thing about that. That's how I got in, because I spent six months waiting for the Iraqi uh, embassy here to send me back my, my visa. I paid the money. Got nothing wrong in my record, but they just didn't send it to me. And then, like a week before I was supposed to leave, they sent it back saying, "Oh, you need to send it to this place instead." And they kept my money. So I was like, "Well, I'm kind of screwed." Uh, but it turns out that in Iraqi Kurdistan, if again, if you have an American passport, ring a ding, um, I got to uh, I could have a 30-day uh, visit visa, but I couldn't go anywhere outside of that. So that actually limited my mobility. There were some, there was actually a, there was a, a group of Fahilis of these uh, in, uh, Shiite Kurds that lived down in uh, Khanatin. And I was trying very hard to go see them, but there'd be no way I could, even go on the Kurdish roads, it just was too dangerous for me because I didn't have the Iraqi visa and not every checkpoint is created equal in terms of uh, who's actually manning it and what would happen to you at it. So. Uh, but within Kurdistan proper, though, that, that uh, Iraqi Kurdish visa worked for me just fine. I had zero problems within Iraqi Kurdistan, even though it wasn't an Iraqi visa. Mm -hmm. So they may have changed things a little bit since then, like since the referendum, because I came in before. It's possible it's changed a little bit, but I don't think so. I think they've reverted back to the same system of, you know, you can more or less place this how you want. But I, I, I'm really curious to see what kind of customs um, 
in terms of how much money they keep from a lot of these business deals uh, or you know border transactions, I don't know how that's changed. Did that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. So this is a different one of this country you were saying in Hong Kong or China. Um, I'm less familiar with the context in terms of the... the well, I mean, Guam is, 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 is more from the country of the U.S. authority, but it has sort of its special <laughs> central system, the system, and so on for players. So Fair enough. I mean, it's, it's autonomous enough, yes. Thank you. Yeah. Please. Can you, say, can you say a little bit more about using uh, mixed martial arts as an ethnographic technique? Yeah. <laughs> no, I... Uh, so... <coughs> First of all, I thought, play to my strengths. And uh, I, uh, before I left, I got really interested in jiu-jitsu. And I thought, you know, this is a lot of fun. I, I can't remember why. What got me started on this? Oh, because the Peshmerga. I kept seeing these videos of like these Peshmerga, uh, you know, doing these combat things, which I later really learned where, I learned actually a lot about it. So one cool thing I love about ethnography is that you can pick a lens and you can learn a lot about larger cultural uh, trends and cultural facts, uh, even though it's a really random facet. So like, okay, jiu-jitsu, MMA. Um, I got there and I expected this Kurdish martial culture, but I found out the national sport is squatting and smoking. Um, <laughs> that is their national sport. Um, it's still, uh, I talk to a lot of people about this, and like, you know, but you guys are all fighters. I'll go to this taxi driver and he's just a totally middle-aged, very soft man. He's like, oh, I'm Peshmerga. I'm like, Okay, <laughs> means you can shoot, but you can't really run very far. Um, and I don't mean that mean nothing personal. It's just, you know, I expected GI Joe Kurdish version, but they were not. Um, so I learned a bit about. Uh, it's basically for a lot of their uh, a lot of their uh, propaganda videos. It's the same thing with the ISIS videos. Actually, I learned a lot about the ISIS propaganda videos by learning martial arts in there. Yeah. And uh, talking about so part of my dissertation on masculinity. Uh, because I felt like, you know, I, when I was in Turkey, I was thinking about doing the Ayyub Sultan shrine. But I went in there, and there's a six-year-old Turkish woman praying with, uh, with a niqab, and I'm like, there's no way. Like, I'm not going to do anything with this. Like, I just, it, this is not an access problem. You know, she's not going to want to talk to me, and I don't blame her. You know, this is culturally inappropriate. Uh, so I was like, the heck with this. I'm talking to the guys, <laughs> you know, because I can talk to them easily. Um, and I, what I really did find is that... Uh, there was a lot to be said about wanting to appear strong. That is such a strong facet in the culture, especially with uh, between uh, everything that was going on, that they had wanted to appear strong to other people, um, to each other as well. Um, so, I mean, I'll just dish out a couple of things. I, I go on for a long time about it in my dissertation, but uh, and I already told you about the Arab guys that wanted to kick my butt, just to, not because they were mean, but because they wanted to show that you know, they were strong. This is my 30%. Boom. <laughs> and there's my elbow gone for a week. Um, they gravitated toward, like, I went to the fight uh, night, and I was there with a couple of American contractors, and I started bonding with them a bit, being like, hey, you know, we do this too. So we started watching these guys, and uh, it was quickly apparent that every single one of them, and this was consistent across the board, they gravitate towards the flashy martial arts. Not every martial arts is created equal. You know, we watch the movies and they look like they're all this magic stuff, but really, it's, you get hit in the face pretty hard. That can be done. One hit, and that's all it takes. Um, but there are these, they went towards the flashy ones because it was a spectacle. It was this display of masculine strength that, that was the most important aspect of that to them. So we'd watch these guys, and they're doing these great flourishing kicks. They learned about Taekwondo, a Korean martial art, but like I, and I had a friend that did the same thing. He showed me these great moves. But I just go straight for his leg, knock him down. And I'm like, okay, look, I, I don't want to rub this in your face, but like that's cool in the movies. But in reality, I was just on top of you, and I could have choked you out. And that's it. It's not flashy, but it works. But it taught me a lot about what was important to them as men, as the culture, you know, showing that it was that important to them, that they expended the resource on this. Uh, in turn, so... Uh, I, mean, I tried actually to get to a jiu-jitsu tournament in Abu Dhabi because the prince there is made it their national sport. So I thought it'd be fun to rub shoulders with them, but then they shut down the airports. Um, but, uh, sorry, don't get me going to martial arts. I, I'm, I'm really a nerd. Uh, but, uh, yeah, so it was, it was a really actually a very good angle to take, even though it seemed at first to be worthless. Um, I learned a lot, and I learned a lot about, uh, so the, the bodybuilders, uh, 
they, you have to pay for everything. Uh, the cost of any given item gets larger. You know, obviously the economic siege goes on. So these guys, you can only get so big without steroids. You know, so they, uh, it, part of the culture, they're very big into steroids. But it costs so much. So like, so when the economic siege happens, and I still got these big guys coming in. And like, you start shrinking when you stop taking supplements like that. Like, you can't keep it. <laughs> so it just told me on the margin how much money are they willing to expend but they have families you know how much money are they willing to expend to keep this image quite a bit was the answer you know they, they wanted to maintain this even though they were under economic seizure it was hard to get medicine um, like people were dying because you know they couldn't get medicine but these guys are still you know they're still shooting up well not that kind of shooting up you know they're juicing <laughs> so but it told me just how important this was so it was an, you know, take music, take anything. If you explore it and you learn enough about the languages and the cultures, it will tell you a lot, you know. So the, you, even these small weird angles, you know, they have substance to them. You just got to find it. If that answered answer your question a bit? No, and it's been very good to read your dissertation. <laughs> There's certainly an article there. Oh, yeah, yeah, for sure. <coughs> if, if for some reason it has to come out of the dissertation, I am writing an article. I spent too much time in that gym. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, you had a question. Yeah, I was going to ask another question about the referendum. You showed the, the photograph of the mayor with the blue ink. Um, were, were the opponents of the referendum as excited about participating in uh, Democratic vote? as the Parzani faction, or, or, or was it, or would, so, so what, what was interesting, what, what was exciting about them? The idea of independence, or the idea of participating in democracy? It was the independence. I mean, it was the, the democracy is the means to the end, but I think it was all tied up together. Um, the, within, within Airbill, the place where I was spent most of my time, um, before the referendum, people were almost embarrassed to admit they were not for the referendum. Maybe one out of every 10 taxi drivers I talked to, I talked to so many taxi drivers. Um, they were all very pro-referendum. Um, but then I went and talked to people in Slamani, like, oh, no one rep no one supported it. Like, okay, so you didn't and your friends didn't. But <laughs> like, I was just in a city where pretty much everybody did. What was the final? So, Ninety-two percent, and I honestly okay. think that was—I think that was a, a genuine election, like a, or a genuine referendum. I don't think that that was—I uh, don't think they had to mess with it. No, but people who were not in favor of it may not have voted. They may not have voted. Yeah, I don't—I don't, uh, don't have percentage numbers on participation because they didn't really know they really keep those numbers really well. Again, you know, anytime you deal with numbers in the Middle East, everyone starts stopping. Everyone stops talking. As far as I know. Participation rate is really high. Yeah, it was it was supposed to be really high. So I don't know if that per, the, the percentage that didn't participate would have voted no or not. Mm -hmm. But I know like everybody I knew voted. Mm -hmm. Except for the Arabs that were in Ankawa, they stayed at home. You know, they wanted to stay out of this. That was that was very much their it, even the gym, which is open all the time, they closed. So they're like, we're going home, man. <laughs> stay home. Yeah, I think Muslims who lived in that area, they voted, like, they either did not vote or voted no. I, uh, so you know, I felt the demographic difference of being who said yes and who said no. They were very reluctant to talk about it. Like, I, even in private, I would talk to some of them and they, they wouldn't really want to talk about it. And, um, yeah, it's either, uh, especially the, I know a lot of Assyrians voted no. You know, some of the Assyrian Christians that lived in Ankoba. Um, but it wouldn't surprise me too much. It was, it was a little hard being an Arab in that area. We were on a bus drive, a whole bunch of us all together on this bus drive, uh, going out to a big picnic. And we were coming back, uh, we got stopped by a checkpoint. And the security guard took all of our, of our IDs and he's like, are there any Arabs on the bus? He had like five or six, but like, no, everybody at the same time. He, first of all, the security guard couldn't read because if, if he could, he would have seen right away, okay, Arab, 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 Arab. Um, but, yeah, it was uh, it's a, a lot of times, especially the police forces, make it difficult to be uh, an Arab or a non-Kurd in that area. Um, so it would not surprise me whatsoever if most of them voted no, but most of them didn't want to talk about it. I mean, there may be articles out there on it, but I didn't find any. Um, I haven't really looked hard either because I had to I had to call it somewhere in terms of my 
my research, and I had to, I couldn't spend the time that would be required to really get into the NCOA community, <coughs> if that makes sense. So, but yeah, so it was, it was interesting. Um, but then afterwards, I was with my bu bus or cab driver, and he opens the window, this is like a month and a half later, and he yells out the window, nicely done, brother Barzani, and <laughs> he drives off. And it was, you know, I didn't ask him to do that, he just, <laughs> yeah, so it's interesting. Anyway, um, any last questions? I don't want to take everybody's time. I know everybody has stuff to do, but I'm an open book. So, if you have any further questions, uh, I, I mean, I'm in the Indiana Registry, so feel free to email me. So, thank you very much for coming. I really appreciate seeing you all. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you. And thank you, Ken.